uh, were, were joined by a third, which was that uh, Tan Shui, the, the dictator of this country, the head of the SBDC for a long time, wanted to establish a system that diffused power after he'd gone. He had jailed the previous dictator, Ne Win, when he came to power. He didn't want the same thing happening to him. He didn't want to see his family thrown in jail or exiled. He didn't want them to lose their enormous wealth that they appropriated during his rule. So he established a political system that very much divided power among a number of different bases. And that meant that there's nobody who can really emerge in this current uh, system in order to challenge him directly or to really challenge his families. That may not last for long, but certainly it's lasted so far. And he's very much disappeared from politics. He's now no longer pulling any strings. Apparently he's engaged in forms of mystical Buddhism and um, uh, his family have kept their very significant wealth and seem to be going on perfectly fine. So in this situation, we have had though, a really remarkable shift in terms of the speed at which reform has taken place. What has happened is that the current president, Tencent, has opened up the country in a really remarkable way, and I think it's far quicker than anyone actually expected. So we've seen, for example, the release of political prisoners, including Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, the admission of the NLD to parliament, um, the holding of fairly free by-elections that allowed them to win uh, 45, 40, 44, 45, or 46 seats, um, the lifting of the blacklist of people who were in exile, allowing a great many of them to come back, the end of censorship, uh, very significant economic reforms, a uh, huge opening up of the political space, legalization of unions, the legalization of demonstrations within certain constraints, um, but a very significant opening up of the society. Uh, it's been a very dramatic, very rapid, top-down process. Um, it's hard to think of a similar situation where something has happened as rapidly as it has here. However, it has opened up a great many potential problems, and it's only now, after the initial sort of euphoria is starting to fade, that we're now seeing those problems. And the principal two problems are of uh, conflicts. One in the southwestern coastal province of uh, Rakhine, where very serious uh, ethnic conflict between Buddhist uh, Rakhine people and people who, uh, many of whom self-identify as Rohingyas. There are also other Muslim groups that the ethnic picture is quite complicated, very intensely politicized in a number of ways. Um, but this conflict has left at least several hundred dead so far, large numbers of houses burned, uh, large numbers of people displaced. It's only the most recent of a whole series of uh, ethnic uh, outbursts of violence in this region. It's certainly been one of the most serious, and it's going to be a long-running problem that really does threaten the reform process if it continues. Um, the second is the ethnic conflicts that are going on around the country. Now, a number of these have been resolved. We got very close recently to seeing all of these ethnic conflicts between um, various different official ethnic armies and the government actually resolved. It hasn't quite reached that point because the Kachin um, have not yet signed a, a peace agreement, although talks have been going on. Those talks uh, appear recently to have faltered. I don't think they've entirely broken down, but there are certainly very serious problems with them. So we're in a slightly dangerous situation where they've been resisting government's efforts to make peace. The government has not been fully living up to some of its pledges either, and we're seeing that conflict continue. Those conflicts around the periphery of Burma are enormously important, because without a resolution of those, the whole national project, the whole desire to economically integrate the country, the uh, ability to connect to neighbors such as India and China and Thailand and develop a whole variety of economic links, all of those things would be threatened if unless an effective peace can be made with the ethnic groups in the Buran. So those are the two of the most critical uh, issues that the country faces at the moment. The one that's been getting the most attention recently because it did blow up very significantly at the end of October is the Rohingya problem. Um, large numbers <coughs> of Rohingyas have been killed, a great many of them have fled both to Southeast Asia and uh, across the border into Bangladesh. The history of this issue is 
complicated all across coastal Southeast Asia uh, for more or less a thousand years, over a thousand years, about 1200, 1400 years, there have been Muslim communities. The origins of these Muslim communities are very diverse. These are um, a mixture of um, traders, uh, converts, people who came from the Arab world, from Central Asia, from India, Bank, what is now Bangladesh, more sorts of places. Now, in most of these countries, in, in most of Southeast Asia, for example, Malaysia and Indonesia, they're Muslim countries. These people fit in very obviously. Um, there are large Arab origin communities in Indonesia. They don't represent any sort of religious or other threat to the majority. Burma is obviously a Muslim, uh, Buddhist majority country. These people have often been perceived as a threat, even though many of them have been there for a long, long time. In addition, under British colonialism, there were significant movements of migrant laborers, as again there were all across Southeast Asia. Um, for example, to this day, in, in places like Vietnam, you still find people who Pathat or Pashtuns from Pakistan who were brought in to work in the French railway system and ended up stranded in Hanoi and have become completely Vietnamese. They don't speak any of their, own, of their earlier languages or anything. But these sorts of communities exist everywhere in Southeast Asia. In most countries, they've either been integrated to some degree or they're tolerated to a certain degree. In some cases, they do face a certain amount of prejudice. The history with the Rohingya thing is complicated by the fact that in 1947, when um, uh, Burma was becoming independent and separating from British India, many Muslims in this area did engage in an effort to either be incorporated into the newly formed Pakistan or to separate out completely. And the conflict that then blew up between Buddhist Rakhine people and many of the Muslims was very violent, resulted in huge displacements on both sides. And that, in many ways, is not quite the origin of the conflict, but it is certainly a key point. And a great many people are still referring back to that moment when these disloyal Muslims were trying to separate themselves from um, Burma, that they were not part of the Burmese nation nationalities, they didn't identify with the country, they're not part of the country. Over the years, this has progressed in various ways, and through a series of very violent pogroms against these communities, into a very widespread belief in Burma that these people are Bengali mi migrants who came in from Bangladesh, but they have no place in the country, that they represent a threat in a number of ways, that they're trying to convert people to Islam, that they have more children than, Bur than Burmese Buddhists do, and therefore they will gradually outgrow this, that they're terrorists, that they're connected to international Islamic terrorism. In fact, of course, the picture is massively more complex, very different from those stereotypes. Uh, one of the problems of having uh, many decades of military rule is that there's been very little to counter the sort of uh, image put out there by successive military governments. Um, an official, you know, uh, who was it? It was the, the consul, Burmese consul general in Hong Kong not long ago wrote a letter to other consulates in Hong Kong about the situation in Rakhine and about the Rohingya situation. He described them as ugly as ogres in a sort of diplomatic letter that set out. So there's a very profound uh, sort of racist element to this. And it's a racist element that's actually very much propagated by the Buddhist establishment in many ways. Um, there's a tendency, I think, in the West to regard Buddhism as a, an incredibly peaceful religion, one that uh, doesn't embrace violence. And certainly in its, um, in its sort of written doctrines, it doesn't talk much about violence. But of course, as a lived religion, as a, something that people uh, embrace in, in, in real ways, it's actually an incredibly violent and often very deeply racist uh, religion. You see this in Sri Lanka, for example, where an uh, enormous uh, amount of the province is driven by extremist Buddhist parties there. You see it in southern Thailand, where um, Buddhist monks have been at the forefront of uh, the efforts to marginalize uh, Thai Muslims in the south of the country. You also see it in Cambodia and Laos, and, and uh, uh, even to some degree in the north of Thailand against certain minorities there. So some, the connection between nationalistic, 
racist Buddhism and its violence is very profound and it's having a very, very serious impact in the country at the moment. We see this in demonstrations against the Organization of Islamic Conference in, uh, in Yangon. We're seeing it in um, messages that are being put out by Buddhist monks all across the country. What is really concerning is that there's going to be an expansion of this prejudice to the much wider Muslim community, which makes up maybe 4 to 5 percent of the population as a whole. There are no accurate figures in Myanmar, so it's very difficult to sort of really say what the actual percentage of the population is. But it's certainly significant, and it certainly runs the risk of there being very wide scale attacks and very wide uh, violence against. Muslim communities. That would present a serious threat, in part because uh, the police are very closely involved in some of these attacks, and particularly in Rakhine province. You've seen the police very much engaged in encouraging the attacks, they certainly have been preventing them. The attacks in October were certainly very well organized. They were driven very much by a local political party. Now, there have been concerns that the government in Yangon is using this somehow as a way to sort of manipulate the political situation, maybe as a way to discredit Aung San Suu Kyi, um, maybe as a way to divert attention from some of the economic problems. I have to say I very much doubt that. I'm fairly certain that there is local uh, political engagement in, in some of these problems. I think certainly the local security forces are almost certainly engaged in it, but the government has actually moved to detain a fair number of people in the political party in Rakhine who are causing some of the problems. It has sent in more troops. The troops are guarding or separating the two communities and acting as a buffer between them. They have made an effort to get a grip on the violence, but nothing has been done to address the deeper problems there, and those are problems of poverty, economic competition, the um, unfortunate nature of the Nationalities Act there, which um, lays out the potential route to citizenship, which is almost impossible for most Rohingyas to go through, even though they may have been there many generations. Um, the NLD has not, I don't think, responded well to this situation. Um, rather than actually coming out with a full-throated condemnation of the violence that's gone on, um, the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi have equivocated to some degree. One of the great problems here is the Rohingya are enormously unpopular among the mass Burma, Burmese population, Burma population in particular. Um, supporting the Rohingya in any shape or form is not a vote winner in any way. Um, there are no political incentives for the NLD to say, well, actually, we, we need to embrace uh, a multi-ethnic society. We need to bring these people in. We need to recognize that uh, the whole dynamics of nationalism in this country are deeply flawed and must be addressed in a whole number of ways. And I'd say I think it's a great shame that Aung San Suu Kyi has not done that and has not gone out there and shown the sort of moral leadership that she has shown for many decades in terms of the pursuit of democracy in the country. Um, she is, I think, one person who has the potential to change the whole dynamic and the whole story of nationalism in Burma. Um, to create a society that is genuinely tolerant of diversity. Burma can only really exist as, in a, as a country if it becomes more tolerant, and if it becomes uh, more willing to give real power and resources to ethnic minorities. Not only does it need to do that in terms of holding itself together and minimizing violence, but it actually needs to do that in terms of becoming a coherent economic entity because the eco economic uh, areas of influence are actually shifting from the Burman-dominated lowlands in the center of the country to the periphery. The economic links with China, um, with India, with Thailand, these are as important as the sort of base of the economy in the farmland of lowland Burma. So unless they embrace that, you're not going to see the integration um, and the effective development of a country. I hope that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi will find a way to sort of craft uh, a more effective national dialogue. Um, her father had tried to do this to some degree. He wasn't successful. Uh, he was assassinated before he could have been successful. But he did, in those early days of Burmese independence, 
put out a message that was uh, much more tolerant than the NLD has been putting out recently. And that, in some ways, leads me to the next critical test, I think, for the country, which is the elections in 2015. These will be the first elections in which the NLD will be able to contest all of the seats across the country. Under the current system, which is the first-past-the-post electoral system, the NLD will almost certainly sweep uh, Parliament and will control the vast majority of seats because it's pretty much able to get the 51% necessary in more or less every single uh, constituency around the country. There will be an enormous danger in that actually happening. If, uh, the NLD wins more or less every seat, it will marginalize a number of very critical constituencies. One of the critical constituencies is, of course, the military and the existing power structure. And no matter how much the NLD may wish them away, they're not going to go away. And nor should they go away to some degree, in that the country will still need security forces, they will need to change, but they will still need to be there. And a relationship between the NLD and those people needs to develop effectively. Secondly is the minority issue. Minorities are increasingly distrustful of uh, the NLD and its leadership. If they're obliterated in the election and have no representation in the national parliament, they will feel no willingness to sort of cooperate, to engage. There's a very real risk of going back to arms, for the ceasefires breaking down, and the sorts of, of uh, civil conflict that the military is often warned about. Um, the third group that uh, would be marginalized would be the other democratic parties who are relatively small, often ignored. But it's extremely important that uh, different political units develop in the country, that the NLD doesn't become a one-party state. The reason for this is the NLD, as a political party, is a very loose grouping. It's really made up, essentially, of two parts. One is this sort of um, popular mass group, and the other is very, very small elite around Xi Chi. And the two are not actually very well connected. There's an enormous adoration for Xi Chi, an enormous respect. But there's very little political structure. There's no mechanism for somebody in the sort of masses of the NLD to work their way up a party ladder and become party leader in the future. What there is is an elite that's been a very durable elite, and then there's a great mass of people underneath that. That means that it's a party without much in the way of ideological links. It's a party that is not um, well connected between the leadership. It's not internally democratic in any way. And that's an enormous problem because if you don't practice internal democracy to some degree as a party, you're not going to practice it externally either. Um, authoritarian parties tend to become authoritarian uh, in, their, um, in their rule, even if they are elected. Um, and the, you're also, I believe, going to see what we've seen with the ANC, for example, in South Africa, which is that when you have a party that's focused on one big political ambition, which is essentially the, the overthrow of apartheid or the overthrow of military rule, but, but really doesn't have much in the way of plans beyond that, you end up bringing together a lot of very diverse people. But then those interests um, diverge. You end up with a political party that has very, very little in common. And that's an enormous problem in many ways because you end up with a very weak, incoherent party. You end up essentially with a, say you have 500 MPs in Parliament, what you have is 500 different political parties under a very, very loose ban. And I have a sense that the NLD may go in that direction. There is another problem, which is that for many years now, the Burmese economy and politics have been completely dominated by cronies of the military and the military themselves. In that context, a lot of those people, and we're already seeing this, are going to want to be on the side of the winners. So they're migrating steadily to the NLD. So the NLD is going to, and the NLD will ultimately have to embrace them, because they'll have to embrace people with money and power and influence. And those people will end up going into the party. You're going to see an incredible corruption emerge within the NLD. Now, it may not happen at the top levels. I, I doubt very much that Aung San Suu Kyi would be involved, or even the people around would be involved in this. But what you will see, I think, is across the board, um, a degree of uh, corrosion, a corrosion of money. And we see this all over the world, in the United States and everywhere else. And it's an enormous problem, uh, I think, in pretty much any democracy. 
but I think it's going to be a very significant problem. There are not some ways around some of these issues. I think an absolutely critical thing that Aung San Suu Kyi needs to embrace is proportional representation. The first past the post system will only create um, a very unhealthy monopoly on power for the NLD that will be profoundly damaging to longer term development of democracy. Proportional representation would still allow um, the military, the other interest groups, ethnic minorities, <clears throat> to have a stake in the current political system rather than be completely excluded from it. Any change in the electoral system requires a degree of national consensus, it requires a discussion, it requires broad agreement among political parties. So now is the time to start having that conversation. <coughs> and it's troubling that it's not happening, that they're not thinking about 2015, except in terms of the victory that they're going to achieve. But, um, you know, as St. Teresa of Avila said, more tears are shed over answered prayers. The uh, dominance of the political system by the NLD would be profoundly, profoundly troubling for the country and may well result in an ultimate uh, reversal to military rule or to some sort of corrupt, chaotic, um, very problematic form of government that wouldn't benefit anybody. The other issue is the presidency. Um, Tencent has said that he doesn't want to run for a second term. He has a pacemaker, he's not very well. Um, his job is enormously demanding. Burma is a very hierarchical country, and in some ways, that's actually not such a bad thing at this particular moment, in that when Tencent says something, that is generally broadly adopted. He's able to push through reforms fairly easily in many ways because it is so hierarchical. Likewise, um, within the NLD, Suu Kyi has been able to have a very significant influence precisely because it is very hierarchical. That's not really sustainable in the longer term, and of course, very hierarchical systems create enormous problems of succession. Suu Kyi herself, under the current constitution, is not eligible to uh, run for the presidency. Uh, president is elected indirectly through uh, uh, an electoral college made up of parliaments. Uh, she has uh, children who are foreign citizens. People are not allowed to run for the vice presidencies or the presidency if you have children with a foreign passport. And in fact, recently, the person who was selected for the vice president ended up not getting the job because his son had taken Australian citizenship and this came out and he had to be excluded from the process. So they're obviously enforcing that part of the constitution. Now the constitution will obviously needs to be changed at some point. I think for Suu Kyi to press that as the key political issue on her agenda is going to look incredibly self-serving and problematic. What might be possible is either to have some sort of interim president who follows on in 2015 from Tencent, or maybe to extend his term in some sort of arrangement um, whereby then the constitution is amended. At the moment, it's not even clear that the constitution could be amended because that would require more than 75% of parliament. 25% of parliament is dominated by the military. It's not clear that they would vote for that. It might down the line. They're certainly shifting allegiances. Um, but it's going to be a, um, a sort of critical issue of how that transition is managed. I, I mean, it, it's obviously not for me to determine who becomes president of Myanmar, but I would have to say that I think it would be a mistake for Suu Kyi to be uh, president, that she has an enormous value, um, a symbolic, <coughs> political, and even economic value as an independent figure who rises to some degree above politics. I certainly would have advised her not to have gone into parliament and not to have taken on chairmanships of committees. Because the more you get engaged in the mundane aspects of politics, the more blamed you are when things go wrong. And things will go wrong. And there'll be enormous problems. But then suddenly you're being blamed for the fact that the garbage has not been picked up and um, you know, that there are constant power cuts and you haven't delivered on the economic growth promise and all these mundane aspects of government become your problem when in fact she is of such stature um, that she could play an enormously important role in really setting the agenda for this country for the next hundred years and she ought to be engaged in a, a much more profound 
exercise um, of power, not to be sitting on parliamentary committees in a minority parliament, in a par party in parliament, niggling over relatively small changes in um, legislation. She's also going to be 70 next year. She's not particularly well. She's quite frail. Um, and I sort of I, I wonder how, how much time she has really to make these differences and who there is out there who might replace her. But one of the great problems of being so immensely charismatic and so immensely important to people there is that you use up a lot of oxygen in the room. Um, there's very little for anyone else. There are no people coming up. There are no people behind it. There are no sort of clear people that you can point to and say these are the kind of leaders of the next generation. That's again, it's a very troubling uh, situation in terms of the long-term development of democratic institutions and, uh, and the economy and all sorts of other um, issues there. The longer term issues are, I think, where the picture gets quite troubling. I think you have to look at uh, some of the, the very, very grim realities of, of Burma at the moment. For all of the talk of um, economic reforms and the re-engagement of the West and the World Bank setting up an office and donors moving in, there are an enormous number of problems that are emerging and they're not all being addressed in the most successful way. We can already see the international community making the same mistakes that they made in so many places that we all that we already know of mistakes that you can predict being disasters right from the outset. There are some sort of basic points that I think everyone needs to appreciate about the country. One is that it is staggeringly poor. And it is one of the poorest countries on earth. It essentially has sub-Saharan African indicators of more or less everything. Um, it is an economic disaster. There's a, a sort of cliche that's emerged that says, oh, Burma was so prosperous and fruit fell from the trees and, and rice grew from the paddy fields. But in fact, Burma was more or less wiped out during World War II. There was almost no economic activity. And then it went into a very troubled process of independence, which the British sort of pulled out almost precipitously, leaving the country to degenerate very quickly in the Civil War. Civil War started then, more or less, in 1957, and is still going on. So in that environment, they've been at war you know, for longer than almost any other country on Earth. That's taken a massive toll in lives. It's taken a massive toll in lost economic opportunities. Most of, in Rangoon, for example, only 60% of households have access to electricity in the biggest, most developed part of the country. If you go out to ethnic minority areas on the periphery of the country, it's 16%. If you wanted to sort of raise the electrification effort, um, sort of penetration around the country to 100%, it would take every single cent of Burma's gas revenues for about the next 20 years just to electrify the country. Never mind building roads, never mind building you know, all sorts of other things. The demand, and never mind building up the um, human capital. Universities have been closed for about 20 years which were not closed entirely, but very, very limited in their abilities to teach. Before that, there was 20, 25 years of incredibly bad university level education. So in reality, they don't have any, they've missed more or less two whole generations of university education, which means there's nobody to teach in universities because you've got to have people with PhDs to teach the people who are gonna get MAs who are going to teach the BAs and whatever. That's completely gone. And it's rather like the situation somewhere like Afghanistan, trying to get back from a complete collapse in your education system is incredibly, incredibly difficult. I'm not sure we fully appreciate this, because if you go to Rangoon, you come across Burmese who are, for start, fluent in English, and I think there's a terrible tendency in the international world to meet someone who speaks good English and think, oh, they're all fantastically well-educated, whatever. Um, there are lots of people who speak English. There are lots of people who are very smart and very capable. But the broader levels of education that you need are very, very low. 60% um, of people fail the high school graduation exam. Uh, 
as high school education and so forth. University education is more or less non-existent. The overall levels of literacy have gone down. It's one of the few countries in the world where uh, people are far more poorly educated than their grandparents were. Um, so across the board, it's an absolute disaster on that front. In terms of the sort of broader economic development, you have very little in the way of um, uh, technocratic expertise. What you had was an economy that was entirely based on rent seeking. It was a matter of if you had the license to sell mobile phones, you were able to sell them. These cost $1,000 for a SIM card uh, that would cost you uh, 10 bucks or something over in the border in Thailand. Um, second, ancient second hand Japanese taxis would sell for sixty, seventy thousand dollars um, $70,000. So decrepit that barely, you know, holes in the floor. These things are gradually changing and the economy is moving up uh, very significantly. But what it does mean is that nobody actually knows how to run a business because even the people who've got rich have got rich on the basis of personal connections and uh, they haven't got rich on the basis of you know, innovation and enterprise or anything else. They've got rich because they were connected to a military official who took a share of whatever they were, was selling. So even in terms of broader economic it's, uh, development, it's two generations in human terms behind the rest of uh, Asia. The only people who really have access to capital in the country are the Chinese. So I mentioned that more than a Chinese, million Chinese immigrants have come into the country over the past few years, the past few decades. Um, they have access to a whole sort of chain that allows uh, of capital that goes, extends back to China and is developed around families and also their own banking system. Very few local people have any access to capital. Um, the country has the, low, the worst access to capital of any country in Asia except for North Korea. Um, and so setting up a business, I mean, the sort of entrepreneurial, small businesses, small scale manufacturing, all those sorts of things, are hampered massively by this inability. The banking system is not trusted at all. Over the years, the government on a number of occasions has um, done things like uh, sort of changed currency and uh, closed banks. Banks have essentially been run as Ponzi schemes a lot of the time. The level of trust in the economy is zero. Um, so the banking system is more or less derelict completely. Um, that's going to be extremely difficult to get that rolling. Uh, agriculture has not had any investment in 60 plus years. And that's going to be extremely difficult to develop, although that's probably the area in which they're most likely to get <coughs> an initial bump. And we've seen in China and in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and a number of other places that the initial reforms in agriculture, freeing up of rice prices, um, opening up of trading systems, the end of monopsonistic systems can give a fairly healthy bump to GDP. However, the other side of that is the currency was still quite significantly overvalued because of the gas sales to um, Thailand <coughs> and sort of emerging energy sales to China and India. Um, overvalued currency hits uh, agricultural exports and of course acts as a, a fairly strong business center to manufacturing. On top of which, while being next door to China creates a whole number of useful um, sources of capital and markets and Else. It also means that Chinese products have essentially wiped out small scale manufacturing in Myanmar. Um, and so there's just essentially a flow of raw materials, often produced under terrible conditions. We're now seeing the emergence of massive scales of plantation farming, particularly in the north of the country, which I think will have devastating economic and social impacts. And this is food that's being shipped up to China. So the more those connections open up, it's going to be incredibly important to see how the country manages its economic engagement with China. People often say it's just become a, uh, it's become a province of China. I was going to say, no, it hasn't. The Chinese treat their provinces far, far better than they treat Myanmar. If it were a province of China, it would be filled with high-speed trains and skyscrapers and brand new opera houses and all sorts of things like that. It's a colony. I mean, it really has become uh, an economic colony to be exploited. Um, now, the Chinese, I think, have realized that this has backfired on them to some degree, and that the government is moving very rapidly towards engagement with Western country, companies and countries that they see as being more responsive and more responsible, and trying very hard. This is a message that Suu Kyi has put out there very strongly. 
but they do want investment, but they want responsible investment. That's a, a hard sell, to be honest, because a lot of the investment from Japan, China, um, South Korea is going to be in very low wage manufacturing. And given the levels of education and everything else, that's pretty much all the country has to offer at the moment. And even that would be extremely difficult unless they actually get their power supply running in a more effective way and their ports built and everything else. They don't even really have uh, the infrastructure. Those manufacturers are also very fluid in that they will move to a cheaper market, um, for cheaper labor at the drop of a hat. The slightest hint of, sort of unionization, they pack up their equipment and they move to Bangladesh or Cambodia or wherever is further down the line. So that's going to be very difficult to manage all of this complexity. And I'm afraid that so far the government hasn't come up with a coherent plan. It wants foreign investment in manufacturing to uh, provide job creation. It wants rural development, but it hasn't worked out ways to balance these two. It hasn't worked out a set of incentives that are going to draw in um, these issues. It needs to address a lot of the cronyism, um, the existing companies and their role. Um, I think we're going to have to see a sort of clean out in many ways of a lot of the projects and businesses that were set up under the military regime. To some degree, that's already happening. We saw that with the uh, cancellation of the Mitsone Dam uh, agreement with uh, the Chinese. But all of these things are going to be immensely difficult to manage in the longer term. And to be honest, I don't see the country escaping a great many of the curses that we've seen in other places, either rampant corruption, environmental degradation, labor abuses. Uh, it may be aware of these problems and they want to do it, but it's very hard to see how they're going to manage any better than, than other countries have. The, one of the critical things that's got to happen at some stage in the next decade is, is some sort of political reorganization of the country. Um, the Constitution's clearly undemocratic, inadequate. It doesn't create an effective country. It's going to be extremely difficult to do this. Um, there are a number of countries around the world, um, and I would group four of them together, very diverse in some ways, but very similar in others, which is uh, Nigeria, Sudan, Pakistan, and, and Burma. All four of them British colonies, all carved out of large swathes of land um, with very diverse populations, all with very, very profound divisions within them, all dominated by military governments from long, long periods of their history since independence, all very heavily dependent on resource exports, which is you know, all of the aspects of the resource curse that plagued all of these countries not one of which has been able to develop an effective identity as a country, to the point that Sudan split into two countries. Pakistan is more or less at war with itself. Nigeria is heading in that direction very seriously, immense difficulties between North and South. And Myanmar has been in a state of civil war for 60 years. None of these countries have been able to do, for example, what uh, Sukarno and Saharto were able to do in Indonesia, which was to craft uh, a very broad, inclusive national identity that has endured and that has actually created more effective nations. Both India and Indonesia, two enormous, incredibly diverse countries, do exist as very solid countries. Both of them are now democracies. Both of them will almost certainly remain democracies. Neither of them are perfect in their democracy by any means, very flawed in a whole number of ways, very unequal in many ways. Both of them have actually done a pretty good job in getting people out of poverty, moving very large percentages of their population out of poverty. Indonesia has done a better job than India on that front. But what these countries did have was a leader at a critical moment. Um, in one case, um, Nehru, and in the other, really, Sukarno, and then to some degree, Suharto as well, who provided um, a vision, and a key component of that vision was um, a secular and multicultural and open society that was tolerant of different languages, tolerant of different religions, uh, that did not impose any sort of uh, top-down ideology on the country in terms of identity, recognized that there had to be a sort of sphere of identity that was left to individuals, left to regions, 
In both cases, there was, I mean, Indonesia was a very centralized state, although that's substantially changed. India was a federal state. But in both cases, a very central part of the ideology and the national message reiterated over and over again, taught to every child in school, was the multicultural, multilingual nature of the country. Now, no shortage of problems in both places. I'm not, uh, I wouldn't give you any sort of ideal picture of either of them. But that message needs to start emerging in Burma. And I hope this is something that Suji can embrace, because I think only she can be effective in terms of uh, coming out with that. What we've seen so far is really quite discouraging, because to, to look at the violence in Rakhine and to say, oh, both, both communities have caused problems is one of those um, evasions that's incredibly troubling and unfortunately incredibly common in times of ethnic conflict. The simple reality is that the Rohingyas have been uh, driven out of their homes, they've been killed in vastly larger numbers than, than uh, Buddhists have been killed. That this is being driven in an organized way by Buddhist groups and political parties in the area and that much, much more needs to be done to stop it. It should be, as Suji has called for, sending more troops to this area. But beyond that, unfortunately, she is following public opinion on this issue, and she should be leading public opinion. She has the most immense capacity to shape public opinion. Probably, I'd have to say, more than almost any human being alive, she carries such enormous weight and charisma. Um, you know, she is one of the few political figures on Earth who is sort of almost universally idolized. But she needs to move on this, she needs to lead this opinion, and she needs to do it before she loses the trust of the minority uh, groups across the country. If she doesn't, then I don't see who else can do it, to be honest. And then I would become very, very pessimistic about the future of the country as a multi-ethnic country that, where people can um, actually exist in a, a coherent, prosperous uh, way and actually address the many, many other problems and not get bogged down in the sort of dreadful cycle of endless conflict that we've seen in places like Pakistan, Sudan, Nigeria, which have utterly um, enmeshed these countries in an almost sort of irreversible poverty and inequality and um, present almost no options in terms of getting out. I think she has a moment, and I think the moment is coming now, and I really hope that she um, gets on with that and actually work, forms a sort of coherent vision for this country and then starts to lead the people there towards that. Okay, I'll stop there. But, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Dozens of people now running around uh, 
uh, Yangon. Myanmar is now the NGO Riviera. Um, <laughs> Everybody is sort of running around doing lots of different projects. It's all completely uncoordinated. Japanese are in every ministry doing things, but nobody knows what. They don't talk to anybody else. The Koreans are doing a whole different set of things. The European Union is doing a whole different set of things. It's very counterproductive. To, and it's such an incredible waste of money. With endless duplication and endless effect of just creating disappointment and resentment and. Uh, uh, anger and the waste of money and far too many foreigners running around doing slightly pointless things and costing too much money. And plus, the, um, I think this whole process of pledging conferences where everyone meets and then they talk about, you know, oh, we're going to give billions and billions of dollars, and it raises expectations, I think, among the general public that somehow they're going to see this money, and they're not going to see that money. Most of that money will never turn up. A vast amount of it will be pledged over and over again. And the same money comes up at every one of these things. The Japanese lot, they're always held in Tokyo. And I'm convinced it's sort of part of the Tokyo Hotel Bureau sort of promotion <laughs> system or something, because they're always held in, in Tokyo, one of the most expensive cities in the world to hold a meeting in. Um, we're, we're seeing just this level of incoherence. And the great tragedy is in, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, number of places we've seen the same incoherence and the same failure to actually achieve results on the ground. I read a very dispiriting article the other day about the experience of the Nordic countries in Afghanistan. When they started off, um, the, they all pledged to have one representative on the sort of aid oversight committee in Kabul. And then somebody turned up from Norway and said, well, we give lots of money, so we want to give a speech. So we're sending someone to give a speech at this meeting. So that was two representatives. Within a year, there were five representatives from the Nordic countries. There are five Nordic countries. <laughs> and that was the Nordic countries who were among the best at sort of actually being coordinated, not sort of insisting on taking uh, the credit for everything. So it's a very dispiriting situation to see the same sort of elemental mistakes being made over and over again, the same utter incoherence in the international response, the same just endless waste of money. And it's not even wasted in a manner that is interesting and entrepreneurial and risk-taking. It's just wasted in the same predictable things that we know don't work. Um, and that's really sad, particularly in a country that's desperate. I mean, the over the past several decades, I mean, I think the average um, sort of aid spending per capita in Burma over the past two decades has been about five dollars a head in the international community. And you compare that to about seventy in Laos, um, fifty in Vietnam, something like similar, sixty or so in Cambodia. It's been significantly lower than anywhere else in the region, and those countries are all actually richer than Myanmar and have fewer problems of HIV, malaria, all sorts. Of so it's had very, very low expenditures already. Now it's got a rush of money, but the money is coming in and being spent on too many sort of hopeless things. Everybody wants to be involved in peace processes. So everybody wants a share of the peace process market. So again, dozens of incoherent um, approaches to that. I think there is some recognition apparently that this is a problem, but I'm not sure the gap between recognition that it's a problem and doing something about that problem seems to be insurmountable. Um, your second question was on regional, uh, regional responses. There's, I think if they don't resolve the Rohingya problem, they're going to run into an enormous backlash in ASEAN because the majority of people in ASEAN are Muslims. Um, of those 500 million people in ASEAN, 250 odd plus are Muslims. And if they get a reputation for essentially engaging in more or less sort of government-backed pogroms against Muslims, it's going to sour their relationship with Indonesia and Malaysia very, very profoundly, um, and risk causing a real sort of corruption. Uh, um, I think in general, though, you know, ASEAN is very keen to see the country emerge. A lot of um, uh, general engagement. Aung San Suu Kyi is in India at the moment. Um, I think she. I'm sure she'll be going to China sometime soon. Um, I think most countries, including even the Chinese, are actually happy to see the, 
country can make progress as long as it's stable. I think there's great anxiety across the region, there's instability in the country. Uh, people fleeing on boats, refugees, the sorts of problems that you see with conflict all over the world, those will create immense anxieties among their neighbors. I don't think there's much the neighbors can do about any of those problems, but they will potentially create quite significant ruptures, I think. Um, on the third issue about being elected and whatever, well, if you put it to a vote tomorrow, she would be elected. Uh, that is not going to happen for a number of reasons. But I do think um, you can have a kind of moral authority without being elected, um, as long as you use that authority, one hopes, in, in a, a manner that's um, you know, productive, not, sim not simply demagogic and uh, um, you know, to, to selfish ends. I do think she's somebody who could be seen to do that. I think often these people are not hugely successful as elected officials. I'm not convinced that necessarily that Mandela was the greatest president ever. Um, he was certainly a supreme political figure, but I don't believe he was you know, that good as a president. I'm not sure what that other was either. Um, but I think these people have enormous kind of influence in terms of shaping the futures of their country. So I'm not that troubled, to be honest, because I think these things happen in a lot of places. There are a lot of monarchs out there that aren't particularly influential, but have often done some good for their country. Juan Carlos in Spain sort of turned the country into a democracy. He was absolutely vital in terms of doing that. Um, he was never elected. He was appointed by Franco, of course, himself. But so I think people can have very important symbolic roles without being elected. So I'm not too worried. Though. Yes, I would like to follow up on that. Why? Why do you think Aung San is not speaking up for both for the concept of multiculture, multi-nation society, or and, and so why is he not really speaking up against the persecution of, of Muslims? Because it, it seems to be it would be such an obvious thing. So is it perhaps that that there is this usual pattern that when there is economic difficulty, the majority tends to scapegoat the minorities and she would need to go against that wind, or perhaps the minorities are relatively small, so for that reason perhaps she has a misconception that it is kind of almost an agendous country or something like that, or what's behind? Um, she's never really uh, given any clear answer Issues. She tends to say the rule of law should be respected, but the, the laws around nationality are somewhat grotesque and also they're never enforced effectively. So simply referencing a law is not enough. I don't know exactly why. I think um, it is a profoundly unpopular position to take. Um, you would simply not find anyone among the Burmans would defend the Rohingyas in any shape or form. They are profoundly, profoundly unpopular on so many levels. Um, and it's a, in many cases, a very deep racism. Um, it's a racism that has almost spiritual sanction in Southeast Asian Buddhism because uh, there's a very profoundly held belief that um, uh, the darker your skin, the sort of more um, evil you are, essentially. Um, the, the sort of shame and sin is reflected in the darkness. <clears throat> I'm, of course, living proof that this is not the case, but I'm completely <laughs> white and you know, horribly sunburned. And I'm certainly not uh, a paragon of virtue in any way. Um, but it's a profoundly held um, belief uh, that's, of course, very corrosive society with racial differences. Um, it's, I, I, I have to say that the kind of spiritual sanction that this has been given by Buddhist monks is one of the most sort of troubling aspects of it, because it just gives it a legitimacy in people's minds that is so intense and corrosive and everything else. And Sushi needs to speak out much more forcibly against the monks that are propagating this. But again, that's an incredibly unpopular position. But 
she needs to take an incredibly unpopular position on this um, and speak out and, and do it again and again and again. And that's a very hard thing to ask me for somebody. Sorry, please. Yeah, it's only just for a second. So if I understand that, it's a really just the fact racism. And for that reason, it's very hard for her to go against the mm. established religion, which also played an important role in the protest. So yeah. it's, as you said, so it Yeah, I mean, it is a sort of complex mixture. I don't know what her advisors are telling her on this. If speaking out will cost her votes, there's no doubt about that. Um, if she, uh, it will cost her political popularity. I don't know how much of that is a calculation. But not to speak out, um, not to sort of condemn the violence more forcefully, and not to be honest about the nature of the violence. This is a very unequal <coughs> fight. There certainly are you know, Muslims who have fought back. There certainly is violence, and there, there has been for a long time. And there's a complicated history here, and a complicated um, set of values and behaviors and clashes and economic competition and all sorts of things like that, which is pretty much always the case in, in places with uh, ethnic violence. But at the same time, what is clearly happening, and clearly happened in October, was organized destruction of you know, Rohingya communities, organized efforts to drive people away, um, and organized efforts to disrupt such things as provision. There are large camps of returnees people who've come back from Bangladesh, or who fled Bangladesh and then were deported back to Bangladesh. And getting aid has been almost impossible to get the regular sort of supplies into those camps. So a lot of people who are suffering quite intensively um, because of the current situation. And it's, I suspect, only going to get worse. It's, it's quiet at this particular moment, but I'm really concerned that there will be further. <coughs> we also don't know exactly what happened. And that's always a problem because with sort of ethnic violence, it's actually very important, I think, to get to the bottom of it to actually work out who did what and how and what the involvement of the security forces was, who commanded them, to actually hold people to account in various ways. That hasn't happened because of access issues. Um, but there has been some quite good reporting by a number of journalists. People are able to get into these places much more freely than they used to be able to. Thanks, Bob, for this very interesting talk. Speaking, you know, as you just said, speaking against, speaking out against this, uh, these divisions in the country, uh, it sounds like she can afford to do that because she is, at least at this moment, so popular. But you also said, if I understood you correctly, the key to success is crafting some kind of a national identity. Mm -hmm. What are some, what would you identify, let's say, as the two or three positive elements or visions around which this country could unify? in order precisely to create this identity. That seems to be the key. Mm -hmm. It sounds almost like when I heard you that we're making actually a major mistake pouring so much money into the country because if it drops on the ground that is only exacerbating some of these divisions. So if you were to sequence, you really have to try to first try to build this national identity. And what would those <coughs> unifying themes in Burma be at this point in time? Well, um, I think one has to reduce the level of mistrust among the minority groups, and that is giving them more political power, giving them more access to resources. Um, they've been very much um, cut out of aid, development, government assistance. Um, you know, most of the money in the country was spent on the military. What else was spent on the sort of Burman majority areas? Very little was spent in the minority areas. What was spent in the minority areas was spent on strategic roads, military camps, things like that. It wasn't spent on general welfare. Levels of, uh, sort of everything, child mortality, nutrition, etc., etc., are, um, are very, very poor in um, the ethnic minority areas. You have to address the inequalities in the country. You could never have a national vision in this country with such profound inequality um, that is based on ethnic lines. Um, so certain ethnic areas are extremely poor. Um, that's actually one of the issues I think that has to be addressed in Rakhine as well. It's a very poor province. 20% of people there are suffering from quite severe malnutrition, which is actually about the rate at which um, you, know, you would have emergency famine systems in a region. Um, it's very, very poor and very few opportunities. 
I think um, a, a vision, which they are, I think, and, and, and to some degree, CG are kind of moving forward on this, is an economic vision of development, of integration with the neighbors, of um, uh, more you know, catching up with the rest of Southeast Asia, but doing it in a much more balanced, um, less corrupt manner. If that can be sort of presented and actually delivered, <coughs> then I think, again, you would see uh, more people willing to sort of buy into a national enterprise. I do think there has to be just a much more significant effort to um, give minorities sufficient space. Um, when I was there not long ago, the, the government had decided to, that it was going to start regulating a big um, Shan, ethnic Shan festival. They'd never actually done this before. But they were trying to put pressure on the Shan on a number of other issues, some economic issues, some political issues. So they decided in various ways to sort of regulate this big festival that they were having. Um, and there's things like that that, of course, create a climate of very intense suspicion and anger. Um, I, I don't quite know how one gets past the, the sense of sort of Burman superiority that still exists in this profoundly divided country. I think only ultimately one builds trust through uh, the rule of law, through fairness, through an ability to challenge the government <coughs> in, in a number of ways, by having a set of core principles enshrined in a constitution or a bill of rights. Um, and then it's a constant struggle, really. It's a struggle for everybody in every country. And the, the whole issue of rights is not obviously an ongoing, uh, constant battle universally. Um, but they have a long, long way to go to sort of regain trust. It works on the other side as well. I mean, you have the Kachin who recently, you know, they didn't turn up to a meeting, they undermined the Ong Min, the main government negotiator. They've been behaving quite badly. Apparently they have um, mercenaries, apparently <coughs> Serbian mercenaries who are with very long um, those sort of long distance rifles who spend their time picking off, retreating um, Burmese military officers in particular. And this, I mean, this is sort of provocative in an environment where people are talking peace on one hand and then assassinating officers um, and carrying out these sorts of attacks on the other, which often leads to this rather undisciplined army carrying out reprisals against civilians and then more attacks. And it's not a, an environment to make peace in. And the leadership needs to recognize that this is an opportunity. There is a genuine change going on. So they risk um, you know, creating very severe. There's a huge, huge need in this country to demilitarize the whole country. And that means not just the Burman aspect, and so dominated by the Kathmandu, the, the Burmese military, but even the minority areas have been completely dominated by these ethnic armies that have controlled everything. They've controlled the economies, they've controlled the politics, they've controlled social behavior. The whole country, since independence, has been completely militarized. That needs to be wound back. And the whole psychology of militarization needs to be wound back. That's a long, difficult struggle, as we've seen in Nigeria and Sudan and Thailand, even. Um, so. Yes. Um, I think you gave a, a really uh, uh, accurate and uh, uh, well developed picture of the problem. I take a much more optimistic view of the outlook. I mean, you stated the difficulties, yeah. and I want to elaborate them even further. Uh, but I base my optimism on, on basically on uh, two considerations. Uh, one is that the, the sequence of events is very uh, fortunate mm. that one thing leads to another and they are reinforcing uh, things in a positive way. So the, the way the, the opening started was really very unimpressive. Mm. The constitution was very inadequate. Uh, the elections were uh, largely a sham even though they were quite free. Uh, but then um, the emergence of a small clique within the 
the, um, the leadership, the, 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 the government, the president, and basically his two uh, closest allies, the mm -hmm. then railroad minister and yeah. Uh, yeah. the minister of industry. Uh, <coughs> so the three of them are, are really the kernel of the mm -hmm. transformation from the governmental side. And they happen to be uh, very lucky. Um, as I understand it, uh, uh, they were elected by the, by the general. And the the, uh, the one who got the most uh, votes became the president, the second, the first vice, and the yeah. third. So uh, it so happens uh, that that uh, they same. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
presses uh, because uh, we have, uh, let's say, been active for 19 years and, and uh, um, we can actually do a lot mm -hmm. and they are extremely receptive for that. <coughs> so they, uh, their, their first request was to help build up a think tank, which is advising them mm -hmm. uh, on a uh, legislation. And uh, the people we have sent, uh, they made a big impact. Uh, things aren't always working out, they were, they're meant to, or the, uh, they're not always taking the advice, mm -hmm. but it has, it's having a, a, a big influence. Uh, so uh, I think we can, uh, actually learn from experiences elsewhere and make a significant uh, contribution uh, to making it come out the, the right way. Um, and actually, uh, of course, it's extremely difficult. Um, and you're right in saying that it's, it's extreme poverty extreme lack of human resources. Uh, the, the situation is, is, let's say, comparable uh, to Liberia, where we also thought that we can do, uh, achieve great things exactly because there's such a uh, great need that one can make an impact. But it was important, very, very difficult to get anything done. And in fact, progress has been disappointing, the slow, although it is uh, progressing. So compared to Liberia, actually, uh, the progress is much faster, much faster in, in, in uh, uh, Myanmar. And uh, of course, uh, most of the difficulties are uh, with outside Sushi and Europe. In analyze them very uh, correctly. Um, but um, she also has a tremendous job of getting organized. And she was in, has a very clear vision. I, um, let's say you can compare her role in uh, Myanmar to. Um, Mandela's in South Africa. And altogether, the changeover is very comparable mm -hmm. to, to um, uh, the South African change. Um, but but um, at, the, uh, at the time, when I met her, it was for the first time that I met her, uh, she was uh, very, she had a clear vision of where she was going. She, she had, of course, all the charisma of um, um, uh, Mandela, but she had a much clearer uh, understanding of the practical issues that Mandela never had. Um, um, and compared to that, since then, the fact that she was allowed to enter parliament, uh, she has been unable to develop a, a uh, staff that can support her. So when she was alone and you know, after meditation and so on, she, was, she had very clear vision. Now, now when she's uh, actually sucked into the process and um, uh, caught up in, 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 in politics, um, she has difficulty because she doesn't have anything uh, that's approaching a, a proper start. I think. I think that will also be taken care of, but it will take time. And so um, uh, the um, as I said, of course, it's, it's, it's never going to be as good as it could, as it could be. But I, uh, at, at least for the time being, uh, I'm very optimistic. Uh, it's one of the, let's say, uh, the, the uh, um, 
very few uh, promising pro spots in the, in, in, the, in the world. And even, even with regard to uh, uh, donor consideration, uh, I mean, the European Union is extremely bureaucratic and rigid and so on. Nevertheless, <coughs> there are some people who are genuinely engaged, uh, Robert, uh, uh, what's his name? Robert Cooper. Robert Cooper is uh, effectively, I think, as a I mean, mm -hmm. retired now from the from the EU, but he's working on 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 the the issue. So that's very promising too. So uh, somehow uh, the stars seem to be aligned in the right way at the moment. Uh, it, it can get uh, uh, derailed. And actually, uh, the Ravina problem it is uh, a serious set of derailments. Um, and uh, and Aung San Suu Kyi didn't, uh, I mean, she is losing a lot of her image, uh, at least more perhaps abroad than at home, because at home she is of leading public opinion. She is just uh, uh, acquiescing in it. Uh, uh, and that's a big danger. And I think there's fairly, it's reasonable to, to uh, assume that it's a deliberate attempt to derail the, the, the problem. Because there are very strong uh, forces that don't want a genuine transition and a genuine democracy. But the president actually does. Yeah, he does. It's a really uh, amazingly, and the railroad minister uh, uh, who was in charge of the you know, uh, negotiations, uh, again, uh, had the capacity to convince the nationalities that he really meant it, that this is different from the previous attempts. Um, of course, he didn't uh, control the Kachin uh, negotiations. Uh, I think he does no, not. Uh, just recently. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 and, and of course, you do have the Chinese, who, um, who um, have a, I think, uh, have a, some kind of an understanding with the army uh, to put down the, the catching rebellion. Because the Chinese are, had to pay both the, uh, both the army and the catching, and they are willing to continue so to pay the army but they don't want to be paid as such in the mm -hmm. So uh, I think there is, there is collusion there in, the, in that thing. Um, and the, the countries themselves are, in fact, uh, rent seekers. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 so that's an unresolved. So you've got the Rohingya, you've got the Kachin, um, and you do have uh, uh, within the reformers, uh, a, a group of people, uh, uh, there's an organization called Egress, um, um, which is actually a, 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 a gong group, mm -hmm. government organized mm -hmm. NGO, uh, uh, which is in charge of the Norwegian peace effort, uh, which is uh, interested in a sham transition rather than a complete uh, transition to democracy. So it, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, the outcome is very open, but there is a good chance of, of, of it actually succeeding and carrying it. So I'm less, much at the present time, uh, much less uh, pessimistic than you are in this case. Well, I, I, I do 
think there are a lot of reasons to be fairly optimistic from all the points that you've made. And remarkable things have happened in the past 18 months. <coughs> it has made a huge difference. The atmosphere is so far away from what it was from, say, five years ago. Um, I think they've taken a lot of the relatively easy steps in many ways, the sort of cost-free steps, lifting the censorship. These are things that are very beneficial, and it's great that they've happened. Um, I think we're heading now into a period where uh, they have to make decisions that have a serious impact on specific groups, crony businessmen and others are going to start losing out because of the lifting of regulations, the uh, change in the currency, all of these things. So you're going to start to see the resistance build in a whole number of ways. And with that, the sorts of problems that, that you get when powerful interests are acting against it. I do believe that Tencent is, is enormously committed to reform. I do think he has a, a vision of real change. And I think, you know, obviously Su Chi does. Um, what does slightly worry me is, is how few people this whole process depends on. Um, they just, it's, I think there is, there is a fairly broad desire in Burma to be more prosperous, to develop, to catch up with their neighbors and all these things. So I think there is support out there. But there's, uh, there are so many sort of pitfalls um, and so many countries, and like Liberia is one you mentioned, where, again, you had a leadership who were very committed to reform and everything else, and they've run into a number of roadblocks that are incredibly hard to get over. But also I should mention the role of the emigrants. Two, two, two points, I mean, mm. analytically, I would disagree with you. One is the fact that they are so far behind. It's actually a positive for making progress. It's, e it's easier, uh, you know, when you've got uh, car, uh, um, uh, old uh, cars selling for $70,000 to actually open the market, which they have done. Yeah. And suddenly flood the market with, with much cheaper imports, hurting some uh, uh, oligarchs, but showing some uh, big, big. That's a, yeah. it's an easy, uh, low hanging fruit. And there are many, many low hanging fruits. They haven't yet fit them. Mm -hmm. uh, they just couldn't, just now taking control of the central bank. I think they, they realize that. Uh, they have to bring down the, the, the currency to a value, and agriculture is uh, effectively uh, uh, suffering from the resource curse. Mm. Uh, uh, and they will, I'm sure, within a uh, few months deal with it. They also uh, are working on a framework, uh, which is a this mm. longer term vision of, of, of development. I haven't seen it, but there are early versions. Um, the people who are working on it are very good. Mm -hmm. well. People yeah. who are working on it are generally very good. Yeah, yeah. And and of course the uh, the, uh, the receptiveness towards the returning uh, emigrant uh, com uh, community is also a very big, a, a big uh, 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 positive because there are not that many. But they are more qualified, and and uh, they have really uh, right now a lot of influence. I am always a bit suspicious of the returning emigrants in various countries. We've seen this in a lot of places like Afghanistan. What tends to happen is initially they're welcome back, they bring back expertise, and then tensions build between people who sat in prison for 20 years and the ones who went abroad. And, and then the ones who went abroad have, uh, have a somewhat fossilized view of the country from you know, when they left 30 years ago. And of course, you know, it changed substantially under military rule in many ways. Um, so you end up with these tensions that sort of build. They haven't really yet emerged. Yeah. But I think I mean, you see in so many places, Cambodia, you saw it. Um, uh, Vietnam, you've seen it, uh, Afghanistan, in a lot of these places where a big exile community has come back, the exiles have ended up being ultimately sidelined 
Well, it's the honeymoon period. Yeah, the honeymoon, honeymoon period, yeah. Uh, the same as in Afghanistan, we have the Nazis and Ashraf Ghani. Ashraf Ghani, yeah. Uh, but uh, I think uh, I've made these observations to bring the mm -hmm. thing home to the School of Public Policy uh, because they have a sort of an interesting uh, uh, possibility here because uh, I, I wish we had uh, a proper evaluation of this transformation uh, process, what works and what doesn't work. And, and to study that, Uh, but I think that 
Precisely because Myanmar is not unique, there are a number of lessons that can be learned from other parts of the world where this institution and OSF has been present. And I'll just conclude with a couple of very brief stories about uh, a couple of things that a number of people in the room have been involved in. in uh, well, not in Myanmar, but in Central Asia, Mongolia, Afghanistan. Um, as a result of the number of years that some of us have spent in, in the region. Um, one has to do with programs that aim at um, well, training a new generation of scholars. And one thing about the program that trains uh, academics in Mongolia. Now, one of the mega public policy, challenge, public policy challenges for Mongolia is to avoid the resource curves. Now, um, some of the programs and some of the individuals working at OSF and NCU have tried to create a new generation of Mongolian scholars. They then have to train younger generation that eventually come in and out of government. Um, more recently, we've been doing something with, uh, with Afghanistan. We've tried to engage uh, young um, female Afghan scholars from minor religious minority groups outside of the usual suspect in Kabul and trying to ensure that they get an education, that eventually they, or those among them that are passionate, go back to academia. And try not to see the distinction between academia and public policy or academia and government uh, as, uh, as something that uh, is structural and cannot be addressed. So I think that, um, although on one hand there is no quick fix to Myanmar's predicament, on the other hand I think that there are a number of lessons that come out of the expertise and the behavior of work that many have done in other parts of the world, as I said, Afghanistan, Central Asia, and Mongolia, that could come of use and sometimes a comparative perspective is, is helpful to avoid being too taken up by the enthusiasm of the moment and I share mm -hmm. much of the enthusiasm for what what has happened over the last couple of years in the in, in, uh, Again, no of caution there. I suspect we're slightly out of time. Yeah. Um, oh, fantastic. So I've used my position after all. Uh, <laughs> all right, so thank you very much everybody. Uh, thanks a lot.